We just thank you for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us this past week. And we just thank you for taking care of us and always being there for us. Lord, I just pray as we open your book tonight that you will uh, open our minds to what you want us to learn from uh, the book of Amos, Lord. And I just pray that we'll not just read it, but Lord, we'll put it into practice uh, to make us uh, a better follower of your you, Lord. We just uh, thank you for Linda who brings this to us in truth. We just love you so much and thank you for sending your son to die for us, Lord, that one day we'll spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Y'all have heard of major prophets and minor prophets, haven't you? So Amos is a minor prophet. You know why it's called minor prophet? It's a little trivia. Sure. Because it's short. <laughs> Has nothing to do with the fact that he's not important. Isaiah is considered a major prophet. It's a bigger book. Amos is a contemporary of Jonah and Isaiah and Hosea. And we will be studying Hosea. So he, um, as with each of the minor prophets, his book is named after him. Um, and he is the only prophet that actually gives his occupation before he gives his divine commission before he tells people what um, he wants the Lord to know. Where is Amos from? Tekoa. And where is Tekoa located, roughly? In south of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's about 10 or 12 miles south of Jerusalem also, so he's in the southern kingdom. Um, what was his job? What did he do? Pardon? A shepherd. He was a sheep herder. We haven't studied this yet. It's in um, chapter 7, verse 14, but what else did he do? He was a grower of sycamore figs. Now, I don't know if that's different than a fig fig, but he was also a grower of sycamore figs, but we haven't got to that part yet. Um, like I said before, he's a contemporary of Jonah, Hosea, and Isaiah. Okay, Amos dates around the mid eighth century BC. And which two kings were were reigning during this time? Uzziah. Uzziah and who, which Judah. kingdom did Judah. he have? Judah. He had Judah, the southern kingdom, and the other one? Jeroboam. Jeroboam, the second Jeroboam, and where was he reigning? In the northern kingdom. Um, Amos was a Judean prophet. So he was from the south, and he was called by God to deliver a message to the northern kingdom. Politically, what was going on in both Israel and in Judah? What was it like? Good economy. Good economy, yeah. They were prosperous. They were secure. Politically, they were doing well. Um, a lot of that had to do in the northern kingdom with the long reign of Jeroboam. He was able to restore a lot of their borders. He was able to bring a lot of security to the kingdom. Um, he restored a lot of territory to Israel. And have you been watching the news, all these peace? It's very interesting. Anyway, um, it was also a, a time of peace for Judah and the southern kingdom. And the reason why for that is because Assyria no longer is an issue at the moment because Jonah had gone to Nineveh and they had um, repented. So there was um, relative peace in both kingdoms and they were prosperous. But what were they like inside? They were corrupt. Yeah. Hey, come on in. There's some space here and here and you won't be on the camera. Um, they were spiritually bankrupt, like you said. They were, there was a lot of moral decay, rampant corruption going on, even though it was a time of prosperity. Amos addresses two primary problems with Israel, their primary sins. Number one, they had an absence of true worship. They were, we're going to study that today. And they had a lack of justice. And in the midst of the ritualistic performances of worship, 
they were not pursuing the Lord with all their hearts. We see that in chapter 4, and we're going to see that in chapter 5. Nor were they following his standard of justice, and we're going to see that in 5 and 6. Um, however, because of a covenant that the Lord made with Israel, he was not going to abandon them altogether. He was going to bring future restoration to the righteous remnant. And that is in chapter 9. When we get to chapter 9, there's going to be a little bit of an interpretive challenge that I want us to, to undertake. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the lesson. But that is the overview. There were those nations. There were six enemy nations. And then there was Judah and Israel. And this, the rest of this book, so we did chapter 1 and 2 last week, the rest of this book mainly is directed right to Israel specifically, not just to Judah. So take out, let me tell you what to get out first. Get your Amos at a glance, chapter, uh, page 77. And what you're going to need this for is if you haven't been able to fill in your chapter themes, and that's okay because they're not my favorite thing to do either, um, we will fill that in today as we go. Uh, get out your cross-references for Lesson 2. If you need those, let me know. I have extra. Did you figure out your books? Did you have two of the same book? Oh, you didn't. So we still haven't solved. No, we, we haven't solved because we just yeah, solved. I haven't been through the end of the first year, I guess. Oh, she okay. Died. She died. Oh, okay. she died. I have a book, so I have an extra first and third book, but I thought... Awesome. Here, so I took her the rest of them. So, so literally, we're now on the same page. Okay, we're going to have So take out Amos 3, 4, and 5. And the map if you want, but you don't have to get your map out. How many of you are familiar with John Wesley? What did he know? Yep. Um, he founded what the, is it the Methodist Church? Yeah. Wrote hymns, did stuff. Anyway, he provides, and I wrote it down, the most convincing analysis of what it means to be a true servant. And that's what we are called to be. And that's what this lesson, a lot of this lesson is going to be about serving the Lord, a true servant. This is what John Wesley says. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you can. I love that. Just always, no matter where you go, what you do, um, always be a true servant. All right, Amos 3, let's start. What do you have as your theme for 3? I didn't buy anything. That's cool. <laughs> That's totally cool. I'll just tell you. There you go. Lion, the lion has roared. God is speaking. The lion has roared. And there's, it's about prophecy. About what's going to come. Alright. Sally, we're, actually we're going to start over here with Susan. We usually start on this side. But we're going to go this way with reading. Um, Susan, if you will read verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. You only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So how does the, what are these verses about? One and two. How does it start? What is the first thing it says? Hear this word. Yes. Hear this word which the Lord has spoken. This is not Amos' words. These are the words of the Lord. Verse 1 seems to indicate, because remember I said he has taken this message to the northern kingdom, but verse 1 seems to indicate that the southern kingdom of Judah was to hear this particular message too. And we see that because it says, the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. So this is going to encompass both of them. And I also think, Verses 2 through 8 is that message that's for both kingdoms. And when we're going to see a change in verse 9, that's when it's going to be specifically to the northern kingdom. Um, there's, we can see the relationship that God has with Israel in verses 1 and 2. And what do we see in those verses 
that indicates a relationship. He has chosen them. He's chosen them, yes. Among what? All the families of the families of the earth. That's a lot of people. God specifically chose them. He also says, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. That's when they were in captivity in Egypt. So there was a relationship here. He, this word chosen, um, on page 24 of your lesson, you were to look up the Hebrew definition of the word chosen. Was anybody able to do that? Page 24. Is that the word you have? Do you want to get yada? Y a d a. There's a lot of definitions for the word chosen. This particular translation, when it says "you only have I chosen," that indicates an intimacy. Um, one of the definitions is be acquainted with a woman in a sexual way. That basically an intimacy that's reserved for only of those chosen by him. This Remember when we were in school and we would break into two groups of people and they have two captains and they would choose someone for their team? This is not that kind of chosen. There would not have been an intimacy there of where they know them. God knew them by experience. He perceived them. He understood them. It's more of a uh, when, our, when, we, when our husbands, or we chose our husbands, however that worked, more of that kind of chosen. So it takes that word a little further. He didn't just pick Israel to be on his team. He chose them because he knew them intimately. So the word is yada, like yada, yada, yada. Um, that's what I think of. Anyway, Exodus 19, I'm going to read that, um, verses 1 through 6. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. And when they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. God chose them. He chose them to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. They were God's own possession. They were special to him. But are they beyond being disciplined and judged? No, we're going to see that. But they were the most special people on the earth to the Lord. Ephesians, if you look in your cross-references, Kim, Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. It's on the first page. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. This is the New Testament. So how do we take what we just learned about the chosen people in Exodus, the Israelites, and put it in our situation? How do we take it from their town and put it in our town? We are not Israelites. But what does Ephesians say? He chose us. We are adopted. Yes, and he chose us. It's the same word. Yada. He chose us. So if he, if the Israelites who he chose first were not beyond being judged, judgment's coming, that's what Amos is going to tell them, are we any different? No. Judgment is coming. But not, there, there's still hope. There will be a righteous remnant. But we as Gentiles, 
the judgment's coming too. And, um, but anyway, he chose us. That's the same kind of choosing. But even we aren't going to escape punishment for our iniquities or, or, you know, this side of the cross. Neither were the Israelites. Also, you were to look up the definition of iniquities. That's on page 25 of your lesson. Anybody? Well, I found several. Okay, which one? Uh huh. That's the one I have. Do you have what other ones do you have? Honoria. Honoria. Okay. Did y'all that one? I stuck with Avon. I did too. So, what does Avon mean? Not ding dong, Avon lady. <laughs> Perverse. Perverse, yeah. Depraved. Wrongdoing. Um, it can also be used for the consequence or punishment for iniquity. So what we can say about Israel when it talks, because it's the same word for transgression, for sin, for iniquity. They're depraved. Um, so let's go on then to verses 3 through 8. 3 through 8. Because uh -huh. see in verse 2, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. That means the Lord says to Israel, I'm going to punish you for all your depravity, for all your wrongdoing, for all your perversity, all the things that you do. So 3 through 8. So yeah, Eric. We'll just go this way. And then okay. Okay. Do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he has captured something? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there is no bait in it? Does a trap spring from the earth when it captures nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will it will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets, a lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Okay. What are these verses about? What's the main point of verses 3 through 8? That's a rhetorical question. Yeah, it's kind of a, a tough one. Things happen for a reason. Things happen for a purpose. He's saying to them, if they heard a trumpet sound, a warning, there's a reason for it. When we hear the tornado siren go off, I go on my porch. But anyway, there is a reason for it. When, when we hear the smoke detectors go off, there is a reason for it. And that is what he is saying here. He, he is sounding the warning. When, when we hear the tornado siren, the tornado is not on top of us, but it's sounding the warning. And so you can make a change. You can get to your basement, or you can go sit on your porch. <laughs> but it's a warning that this that destruction is coming, and that's what Amos is saying. They needed to fear the calamity. When my smoke detector goes off in the middle of the night, which it has, don't you know I'm not the. I take I take notice, and there's a fear. Um, so he is saying to them in these verses, judgment is coming. And he says that in verse 8, a lion has roared. We talked last week about when a lion would roar. Um, a lot of times they roar when they're about to pounce on their prey. They roar when they're warning someone that danger is coming. Um, I said this morning I was going to show a picture, and I can't do it now. It's on my phone. Uh, when I was in Uganda, we were on a safari, and we were leaving, actually. It was an overnight and as we were leaving, there were two lionesses, big ones, right on the side of the road. And the road was kind of lower than the banks. And I'm like, I have to show y'all. We're like this close. And the ladies, we were so excited. We opened that van window because they were tinted. And we wanted good pictures. And our driver says, you shut your window and get your face off. You know? They weren't roaring, but after the fact, I thought that lion could have jumped in the car faster than we could have closed that window and we would have been bait. He sounded the warning. Shut the window. He's going to eat your face. She's going to eat your face. <laughs> and it was scary. So remind me at the end, I will show you how close we were. And I'm in that window. I'm taking that, you know, 
But when he did say shut it, we shut it. And, uh, but that is what is going on here. So let's look at some cross references about when a lion will roar. Let's go to Hosea 5, 8 through 15. Linda, if you'll read that. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet of Ramah. Sound the horn in Beth Haven. Behind you, Benjamin, Ephraim will become a desolation in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I declare what is sure. The princes of J Judah have become like those who move a boundary. On them I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment, because he was determined to follow man's demands. Therefore, I am like a moth to Ephraim, and like rottenness to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah his womb, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent King Jerob. But he is an angel to heal you, or to cure you of your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. And I, even I, will tear to pieces and go away. I will carry away, and there will be none to deliver. I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And Sally, if you'll read Hosea 13, 4 through 9. Yet I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt, and you were not to know any God except me, for there is no Savior beside me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of drought, and they had their pasture, they became satisfied, and being satisfied, their heart became proud. Therefore, they forgot me. So I will be like a lion to them, like a leopard, I will lie in wait by the wayside. I will encounter them like a bear robbed of her cubs, and I will tear open their chests. There I will also be devour them like a lion, as a wild beast will tear them. It is your destruction, O Israel, that you are against me, against your health. Do you see the references to the lion? The lion is going to eat your face off. Um, like a lion, the Lord is going to tear them to pieces. And that is what Amos is saying here in verse 8. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord, it says he was going to tear open in, in Hosea their chests and devour them. The warning is being sound. The lion is ready to... to caused destruction. So the lion has roared and they should have been very fearful about what Amos said because these people knew what a lion would do. Unlike us Americans, we thought, oh cool, you're in a zoo. We were not in the zoo. We were in their environment and we and the alarm needed to be sounded. Same here. They knew what that they that this was a warning, but they're not going to heed it as we see. Now let's read verses nine through fifteen. Either Sandra or Terry, whichever one. Proclaim on the citadels in Ashdod and on the citadels in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumults within her and the oppressions in her midst. But they do not know how to do what is right, declares the Lord. These who hoard up violence and devastation in their citadels. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an enemy, even one surrounding the land, will pull down your strength from you, and your citadels will be wounded. Thus says the Lord, just as a shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or a piece of an ear, so will the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria be snatched away with the corner of a bed and the cover of a couch. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts. For on the day that I punish Israel's transgressions, I will also punish the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off, and they will fall to the ground. I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house. The houses of Ivory will also perish, and the great houses will come to an end, declares the Lord. So these verses that she just read, 9 through 15, differ from 1 through 8. We are now hearing about what God is going to do. Now it is specifically to Israel. And what God has done here, he has called Ashdod, as we see in verse 9. Proclaim on the cities in Ashdod. That's in Philistia, if you were to look at your map. And he says to Egypt. He wanted them to witness what's happening in Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. His people, 
did not know what is right, verse 10. But they do not know how to do what is right, declares the Lord. Why didn't they know how to do what was right? Because they don't remember from his hearing and his statutes. And they weren't following his statutes. They did not know the word of the Lord. They were not following what the Lord had told them. We can't expect the world to do what's right. They don't know. Um, we do, though. We know what is right. Um, Israel had gone into idol worship um, from the very beginning of that nation. Uh, if you look at 14 and 15, it talks about the altars of Bethel and the horns of the altar will be cut off. They had brought their idols with them out of the wilderness. Bethel, we're going to look at some cross references. Bethel used to be called the house of God. That was their place of worship. This was a very special place for the Israelites. And it has now become one of the places where false worship is happening. The golden calves have been set up. So let's go to our cross references again. We're going to look at how important Bethel was to the Israelites. Genesis 12, 8. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and... I on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Abraham built the altar there. This is where Abraham built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. If you'll go ahead and also read Genesis 35, 10 through 15. Okay. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give it to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink of offering on it. He also poured oil on it. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. The same Bethel that now false worship is happening. So Jacob named it the house of God because that is where the Lord appeared to him. So you can, you're starting to see what a special place Bethel is to the Israelites. Um, 1 Kings 12, 25-33. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now, the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, This is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up. From the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now, this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship <coughs> before, uh, before the one as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places, and made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah, and he went up to the altar. Thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. Do most of you remember when we studied this? This is not Jeroboam number two. This is Jeroboam number one. And he is the king that caused Israel to sin. And we'll, a lot of times the king of Israel will say he did evil like his father Jeroboam and he caused Israel to sin. This is where he set up false um, idols at places that were places of worship. 
And the reason why he did that is he did not want them going down to Jerusalem. So he made his own priests. They weren't from the tribe of Levi. He made his own festivals. He made his own religion. But he didn't want people to leave. And so he, he was making it convenient for them. But he was an evil man. So up until this time, Bethel now was called the house of God. But now in Amos, Bethel is referred to as a place of sin. It is no longer a good place. Um, it's become a place where the king of Israel also had a residence. He built a place there, including in Samaria. Verse 15 of Amos 3, if you'll go to that. It says, I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house. The houses of ivory will also perish, and the great houses will come to an end, declares the Lord. This is mentioning the wealth of Israel and the certainty of judgment on these great houses of the wealthy. Um, did they? Do you think they thought perhaps something was going to happen to them? Absolutely. It was, a, it was a good time. It was a time of prosperity. Being wealthy was not their sin. Their sin was what they did to get wealthy and what they did to other people, their injustice. So at, let's, let's apply this a little bit. Let's do some application. Let's take it from their town into our town. We call that crossing that hermeneutical bridge. That means understanding the scripture. We are, like I said before, we're not Israelites. We, we are 21st century Gentiles um, living in America, but we are all believers in this room. What is the application here? Follow the Lord's commands. Or you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged. That's right. We have to remember who we belong to and what we are called to do, and how we are to treat others. So it's we're going to we're going to be getting there. Um, an alarm has sounded. I mean, I think it's sounding pretty loud in our nation and in our churches right now, and we need to take warning. Any questions on chapter three? If you can think of any. All right. I don't know if I would have any either. Take out chapter four. And what do you have as a theme? It's a recurring statement is what I have as a theme. So if you can find that recurring phrase. Yeah, that's the one I have. It's okay if you have something different. This is for you. This is so you can look at your chapter and you can know what it is that's in there. But I put, you have not returned to me. That is repeated in here. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I have it marked one, two, three, four, five times in 13 verses. Yet you have not returned to me. Um, let's look at first verses one through three. Sharon, can you read those? Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon, declares the Lord. Okay. Chapter 4 begins just like chapter 3. And what is that? Hear this word. Who is he speaking to specifically in this these first three verses? The women. The women. Of the northern kingdom. Um, it looks like he's really dogging on him here. He's really not. Um, Bashan, if you were to have looked up anything about Bashan, it was a wonderful pasture land for cattle to graze, and they became fat on this, this land. And so what he's saying is the rich women of Israel were like these fatling cows. They were grazing on other people, taking advantage of them. Um, Go to your cross-references, and let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. It's on page 2. So 
Susan, if you're able to. Second Timothy. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, devourers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm. Timothy says, in the last days, men who claim to be godly will prey on weak women. I'm so glad y'all are here. We are learning the truth of God's word. They're going to be led astray because of false knowledge. These women in Amos, is why they're particularly up there, um, why, why he mentions them, is because this is what they were doing. They were oppressing the poor, crushing the needy. Their lack of knowledge was no knowledge of God's word. That's why they were doing this. Is that applicable today? I'm talking just specifically women. How many books are out there that just tell us, what is that, the one, I hate, just wash your face. Wash your face. Just wash your face. Um, we hear, you know, this prosperity gospel that everything's good, everything's going to be great, God loves you just like you are. No. No, that is false knowledge. We need to know the word and become, be transformed into the image of Christ. That's what God wants us to be. He loves us like this, but inside here needs to be changed. And so we, that's why I'm excited y'all are here. You have a desire to know his word. And even though it's the book of Amos and it's just this obscure book, like I've said so many times, God chose it to be in this canon and there's a reason why it's there. So anyway, there is an application for women here, um, specifically to women. How does it say in Amos that they're going to be taken away, these women? With meat and fish hooks. Meat hooks and fish hooks. They're going to be taken away from their wealth. Um, they're going to be taken away from their security and away from their pleasures. A time is coming. They're sounding a warning that it's not always one of the this morning one of the women mentioned you know oprah winfrey i mean this is a woman of great wealth and i believe she is not a good woman and she i believe i put her in that that's what i that's what i think of in today's time the view. pardon the view oh yeah it's just anyway so <coughs> cows of Bashan, that's how we can think of them from now on. <laughs> All right, let's go on to verses four and five. Enter Bethel and transgress. Enter Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering also from that which is leaven, and proclaim free will offerings. Make them known. For so you love. For so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. This word in, in verse 4, transgress and transgression, that's again that same word, Avon. That, is, that, is that the Avon? Yeah, it's Avon, isn't it? The, your depravity, or is it Yada? Which one? Pisha. So I had, I think I had another word for it, Yada. Anyway, I have to go back to my notes. It's, it's iniquity. It's, it's your depravity. So it's saying, enter Bethel and, and be depraved. In Gilgal, your, your sins multiply. What is the significance of Gilgal? Do you remember from your homework? It's another place of worship. So we're going to look at that in a minute. But first... Um, it says they loved to bring their offerings, their tithes to their places of worship, but they weren't really worshiping the true God. This was 
again, this false worship. Is that applicable to today in the churches? I'm not saying our church, but just the churches. You know, we have people that come to church all over the world. They're not coming to worship the true God. They're coming to check a box. This is what we do on Sunday. And we come in and we sing a song, we give our tithes, we take the Lord's Supper. But a lot of it's done in vain. It's not done in true worship. And that is what is happening here. They're going to these places of worship, but what has become of them? They are no longer houses of God. They're places of sin. And so um, he, is he is giving them the warning. Let's go to our cross-references. Read Deuteronomy 11, 29 through 32. Place the blessing on Mount Ger Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not across the Jordan, west of the way toward the sunset, in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah, opposite Gilgal, beside the oaks of Moray? For you are about to cross the Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall possess it and live in it, and you shall be careful to do all the statutes and the judgments which I'm setting before you today. The importance of Gilgal right here is this is the very first place that God brought Israel when they were in the promised land. This is a very memorable place, just like Bethel. It's very important to them. Um, Joshua 4, 20 through 24. Those 12 stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed. That all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So Joshua built a, a 12 stones here. It became a memorable place so that generations after could look at it and remember what happened here in Gilgal. Joshua 5, 10 through 12. So. While the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land, so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. What was, what was the first thing that they observed in Gilgal? Passover. The very first Passover. Yeah, they observed it there. Um, it was the first time that they now had eaten some of the land's produce. What have they been eating for the last 40 years? Manna. Manna. You know, when I think of manna, because we don't really know what it looks like, I think of communion wafers, this kind of tasteless, flaky thing. But now they have eaten the, some of the land's produce. And when they did that, the manna stopped. Gilgal is a place of great significance. Let's go on now and read... 1 Samuel eleven fifteen. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they also offered sacrifices and peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. What else did they do in Gilgal? Made Saul king. Made Saul king. This was Israel's first king. This was a, a great place. Back to Amos 4, in Gilgal, multiply transgressions. This is now a significant place that had been filled with many memories for Israel has now become a place of false worship. This is, things are not looking good, are they? Let's go to Micah 6, 6 through 8. 
with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offering, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Okay, so we've talked about them coming into the places of worship of false worship. It happens today. So what is, how do we not do false worship? Because look what it says in Micah. You come with burnt offerings, with yearling calves. Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams? We're not making sacrifices of animals now, but we give our tithe. We give our time. These, these are our offerings. But what is God saying in, in Micah? What does God require? What's the first thing that it says he requires? Justice. Were the Israelites practicing justice? No. Um, does our nation think it's practicing justice? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, they're doing what's evil in the sight of the Lord. Their justice is to riot and to... No, we do not have a godly justice in our society at all. Um, what else does he require? Love, kindness. Love, kindness. Um, a steadfast love. And then what's the last one? Walk to walk humbly with your God. Um, God's people had strayed very far away from this kind of worship. Is that kind of thing happening now? Yeah. Yeah, we, I, I know we can walk into church. Many people can. I know me included. So many times I've walked into church and thinking, well, what's that pastor got to say to me today? You know, <laughs> that wasn't a form of worship. You know, many times Pat would hear, that song did nothing for me. Um, and Pat so badly wanted to say, then I owe you an apology. Because somewhere along the line, I led you to believe it's all about you. <laughs> but he never said it. <laughs> but we don't go, we go there to worship. We go there to worship. And it starts with justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with our Lord. That's where it starts. All right, questions before we move on. Comments? Um, I've been studying, you know, what they do, the uh, critical race theory. Oh, I've heard a little bit. And um, it's about justice, but it's involved with what's going on in our society today, and they're bringing it inside the church. Basically, it pits the oppressed against the oppressor, but it's saying basically what it's saying, and this is what the riots are going on, that if you're white, you're a racist. It doesn't matter what you think or how you act or what you do. If you're white, you're a racist. Didn't a year ago the Southern Baptist Convention bring yes. forth a resolution on critical yes, race theory? Yes, they adopted they critical adopted. race theory. And Trump is denouncing it. Yes, he is. But it's interesting because they use that verse, which made me want to say that. They use this verse, but for Micah, the new justice. But justice, according to their philosophy, is not God's it's justice. Not God's justice. God it's loves all people, uh -huh. and we're all equal. And it's not right. what they're saying. Exactly. But it's infiltrating it into the church. Yes, it is. It's it's infiltrating into our denomination. Yeah, it is. And it, it's, a, it's a scary thing. Yeah. Um, so, yes, look it up. Critical race theory. Mm -hmm. um, it is man's justice, mm -hmm. not God's justice. And that is what Amos is really focusing on. So again, timely, very timely. Thank you, Susan. All right, let's go on to verses 6 through 13. But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drain water, but you, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. 
I smoke you with scorching winds and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes the dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. What is the repeated phrase in these verses, repeated statements? You have not returned to me. Yes, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. What is it? Then what is the rest of this chapter about? What is God saying to them? He's telling them what? Since the statement is yet you have not returned to me. He's telling them all the things he has done to them. To what? To cause them to turn back to him. He says a lack of bread. Yet you didn't return back to me. I withheld the rain. Selective rainfall. It would fall on some and not on others. But yet you didn't return to me. I brought scorching wind, blight, mildew, plagues, caterpillar, locusts, but you didn't return to me. I brought plague and pestilence, the sore. I overthrew you, but you still have not returned to me. It, it just kind of gets worse and worse. And he's saying, but yet you have not returned to me. And because of that, what does the Lord tell them? Prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. Meet your maker. Meet your... What movie is that from? Isn't that in a movie? Prepare to meet your God. <laughs> He's destruction's coming. He's coming to judge. Um, let's look at Leviticus back in your cross references. Leviticus um, 26. 17 through 33. I will set my place against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies and those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. If, if also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will also break down your pride of power. I will also make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. Your strength will be set, spent uselessly, for your land will not yield its produce, and the trees of the land will not yield their fruit. If then you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. I will let loose among you the beasts of the fields, which will bereave you and your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your numbers so that your roads lie deserted. And if by the, these things you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with hostility against you. And I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sins. I will also bring upon you a sword, which will... Oh, sorry, I lost my place. Execute vengeance. I will also bring upon you a sword, which will execute vengeance for the covenant, and when you gather together into your cities, I will send pestilence among you, so that you shall be delivered into enemy hands. When I break your staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven, and they will bring back your bread in ration amounts, so that you will eat and not be satisfied. Yet if in spite of this you do not obey me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with wrathful hostility against you, and I, even I, will punish you seven times for your sins. Further, you will eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters you will eat. I then will destroy your high places, and cut down your incense altars, and heap your remains on the remains of your idols, for my soul shall abhor you. 
I will lay waste to your cities as well and will make your sanctuaries desolate and I will not smell your soothing aromas. I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle it in it will then will be appalled over it. You, however, I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword, a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. How does what Sharon just read reflect Amos 4? Pardon? It's word for word. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very similar. There's a repeated phrase in Leviticus, the seven times seven or sevenfold. Mm -hmm. That shows that God will, would continue bringing these consequences on a disobedient nation. So the first set of consequences was caused, was brought on them to cause them to return to him. It says, I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies and those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee when no one's pursuing you. If also after these things, you do not obey me. Again, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. And we see the, the bread, the, the sword, the pestilence, the stench of the camp. Um, he overthrows them, but they don't return to him. Let's look at Hebrews 12. Wait, there's another Leviticus. Let's read Leviticus 26, 40 through 46. Please. I think that's back to Susan. Or back to Susan? Yeah. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers, in their unfaithfulness which they committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies, or if their uncircumcised heart became humble so that they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember also my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land, for the land will be abandoned by them and will make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, will be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinances and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt from the sight of the nations, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. These are the statutes and ordinances and laws which the Lord established between himself and the sons of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. This is telling us that the Israelites knew the consequences of this behavior. They knew what to expect if they disobeyed God. And they still were doing this was not a surprise god didn't just say oh now that you're disobeying me yeah by the way i'm going to do this to you no this was established between god and the sons of israel through moses on mount sinai they knew what was coming and because of that then they needed to be prepared to meet their lord god is it looks he's a little fed up but he does remember the covenant but just because there's a covenant doesn't mean there's not discipline. Judgment is still going to come. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons, as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you were without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we have earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for that moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. This scripture, this passage is telling 
us why the Lord disciplines New Testament believers. That's, that's us. Um, why does he do it? Why? For our own good. For what? So that what? We may share his holiness. So we may share his holiness. Yeah, yield fruit. So that we share his holiness. It's for our good, but ultimately everything is to reflect the Lord. So if we get disciplined and nothing good comes from it, we're not going to reflect the holiness of the Lord. We haven't returned back to him. Um, he wants believers to be holy. And so God desired the same thing for Israel. What did he call them? A holy nation, a priestly nation. He desired the same thing for them to be a holy nation among believers. He desires the same thing for us to be holy amongst the nations. And so he will discipline us. Because um, if we don't get disciplined, what did it say? That you're illegitimate children. There's no salvation there. Um, so let's, like we would tell our kids, if you just do what I tell you, <laughs> you're not going to get in trouble again. So um, it is for our good, and it, it is to reflect. I love that part of the verse. Verse 10, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, the Lord, disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. I love that. So I need to remember that when, when I feel like I'm being disciplined, that I need to reflect his holiness. It's for him. All right. So what do we learn about God from chapter 4? So remember, we're to look for God in these passages. What do we, what do we take from our God shot here? He's our ultimate father. He's our ultimate father. Mm -hmm. He loves us. But that doesn't mean he doesn't punish us. It's the same thing with our children. Um, we punish them. Did, did we punish them all the same way? No. We have one son that I had to just look at him one way and he would just melt in tears. The other one had to be spanked. <laughs> But he still disciplines us. We're not all disciplined the same. But he will discipline when we are straying from him. Okay. Take out Amos 5. If we heed it. If we heed it. If not. He's going to roar. He's going to burn. <laughs> He's going to crumble. <laughs> Yet you have not returned to me. That's the whole point of the discipline. Is to bring us back to the Lord. So that we can share his holiness. Alright, Amos 5. Take that out. It's all good. Don't look. You're all good. You good? Mm -hmm. Alright, let's go to Amos 5. What do you have? I need to sit over there where you are. <laughs> what do you have as your theme? Huh? A blank one. A blank one. I like that. Thanks for Israel and God's wanting them to repent and they're hypocritical. So seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. And it's a dirge. What do we think of when we have to look it up? Dirge. What is a dirge? Do you have a definition? A for the dead. Funeral. A funeral. lament for the dead, a lamentation. It's something we hear at a funeral. Of you ever heard the funeral dirge? So the the dirge is Israel has fallen and it will not rise, and that is what is coming. So now we've kind of shifted here. We've gone from what the Lord's going to do to what is what has happened here. This dirge. We're now looking down on it. So. Um, what did the Lord, he called it a dirge, so why does he call it a dirge? Because she's dying. Yeah. She's falling. In the other yeah. chapters, we saw what God was going to do to them. It's now as though it has already happened. And um, it's about them, as if these things have happened. Amos is filled 
with a, with the certainty of judgment. It's coming. It's, it's no, it might come. It is coming. It is filled with that. And this dirge is telling us Israel would fall and they're not going to rise. And there isn't going to be anyone to raise her up. Um, so this is, this is another warning and it's, and it's in this form of the dirge. So let's look at verses one through three, whosoever turn it is. Hear this word, which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. She has fallen, she will not rise again, the virgin Israel. She lies neglected on her land, there is none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city which goes forth a thousand strong will have a hundred left, and the one which goes forth a hundred strong will have ten left to the house of Israel. Again, it's as if these things have happened. Judgment has come. And there's not going to be anyone that can help you. Look at verses 4 through 13. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live, but do not resort to Bethel, and do not come to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba. For Gilgal will certainly go into captivity, and Bethel will come to trouble. Seek the Lord that you may live, for he will break forth like a fire, O house of Joseph, and it will consume with none of friendship for Bethel. For those who turn justice into wormwood and cast righteousness down to the earth, he who made the Pleiades and Orion and changes deep darkness in the morning, who also darkens day and night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name. Through 13. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong, so that destruction comes upon the fortress. They hate him who reproves in the great and the gate, and they abhor him who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact a tribute of grain from him, though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards yet you will not drink their wine. For I know your transgressions are many, and your sins are great. You who distress the righteous and accept bribes and turn aside the poor in the gate. Therefore, such a time, the prudent person keeps silent, for it is an evil time. Mm. What did the Lord call the people to do? It's a repeated phrase in 4 to 13. What do I Yes, yeah. seek me that you may live. This is a repeated phrase um, because judgment was certain. If you want to live, you need to seek the Lord. Seek me that you may live. The certainty of captivity was also very clear. And the places of their false worship were going to be gone. That's the Bethel, the Gilgal, um, Beersheba. These places were going to be gone. And who is going to destroy them. The Lord. The Lord. The one true God is going to destroy these places of false worship. Um, verses 8 and 9. What do you learn specifically about God in verses 8 and 9? and the Orion, what is, what is the importance of these constellations? What were they used for, do you know? Some of them, they worship the stars or astrology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they did worship the star gods and the moon gods. They used them for direction? Direction. Yeah, navigation. they were used for direction. They were seasonal markers. Um, the rising and the setting of the Pleiades would mark um, for sailors, the seasons. They were uh, used for navigation by the sailors. They also were used for seasons on the nomad calendar. So they were very important. That's why they're mentioned. Hey, God made these. And you're worshiping them. I've made them. And God is able to do all these things. Change deep darkness into the morning. Um, he calls for the waters of the sea. He, he's doing all these things, and it says it is he who flashes forth with destruction among the strong. 
The rulers of Amos' day had wrought transformations. That means they had done things. Look in verse 7. It says, For those who turn justice into wormwood and cast righteousness down to the earth, they made transformations. They weren't good ones. They also silenced their opposition. That's in verse 13. That's what that means. Therefore, at such a time, the prudent person keeps silent, for it's an evil time. They were silencing their opposition. Do we see that now? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do we see it in our, in our nation? Mm -hmm. Do we see it in our churches? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They will silence the opposition. But what God is saying here, in verse, going on then in verse 8, but the one who controls the seasons, the daily things that happen, the occasional transformation is well able to overthrow what man has made strong and fortified against attack. You see that in verse 9. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. We may think we've, we've got it going on. That we can make these great transformations. No, but God can bring it all down. That's his form of justice. Um, he says that uh, he, uh, they hated or abhorred those with integrity. Look at verse 10. They hate him who reproves in the gate. What was significant of that word, the gate? What happened? Isn't it here? Whoops. Well, that's where everything happened. So they were hated anyone who would tell them anything in opposition. They hated anyone that would say, this is not how it should be. This is not the justice of the Lord. This is not how we should be worshiping. This is not how we should be treating people. And they hated it. They also hated anyone who spoke with integrity. It's because they weren't living with integrity. They didn't want to listen to someone who was. So that they would silence the prudent. They would... Um, they were, they were oppressing the poor and their transgression, their sin. Again, we have the word chataha. Um, it, they twisted the standard. They missed the mark. So God's people who had his law were revolting against it. They were twisting it and they were missing the mark. Is that happening today? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we're silencing, or uh, we aren't, I say we. The, the, those with integrity are being silenced. Right? We don't want to hear, because what is evil is good, and what is good is evil. And so they, um, but even though God's people had the law, they were not following it, they were oppressing him. Verses 17, 14 through 17. Who is it returning? I think it's, is it you? I think it's Sally. Go, Sally. Go for it. <laughs> See, they are not evil, but you may live, and lest may the Lord God of hosts be with you, just as you have said, hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, there is waiting in all the plazas, and in the streets they say, alas, alas. They also call the farmer to mourning, and professional mourners to lamentation. And in all the vineyards there is wailing, because I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. Okay, now in verse 14, what is the Lord telling them there <clears throat> at the beginning of that verse? What have we been saying before in verses 4 and 6? Seek, seek, seek the Lord that you may live. Now it's telling, he's telling them, seek good and not evil that you may live. The contrast was that they were calling evil good and good evil. <coughs> Why didn't they know what was right? Because they got gotten away from yeah. the Lord. Their justice was perverted. That word chata, it was perverted, it's twisted. Our nation's idea of justice is extremely perverted. We could even go back to that critical, that race theory. Um, it was so very, very perverted. So the Lord is saying, seek good and evil that you may live. Um, if they sought the Lord, they sought a repentant life, then perhaps he would be gracious to the remnant. Um, God was not going to stop the judgment, but there's hope for those who remain if they sought him. 
They could still turn even when judgment is imminent. Um, in verse 14, Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, there is wailing in all the plazas. There and in all the streets, they say, alas, alas. This is as though verses 16 and 17 here are speaking as if the calamity has already happened. This is a lamentation for Israel's destruction. It is certain. There's even a dirge for it because it is going to happen. It is coming. Verses 18 through 20. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. As when a man pays from a lion and a bear beats him, or goes home, leans, against, leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him, will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? What what is what are those verses about? What are you learning about the day of the Lord in these three verses? It's going to be for who? The unbelievers, the, the godless. It's not going to be what they think it's going to be. Um, some in Israel had misunderstood its intent. And when we talk about the great and awesome day of the Lord, that it's coming. This second advent is coming. But it's not going to be the relief that some think it's going to be. That's what verses 19 is. When a man flees from the lion, he's fleeing. But then what happens? Where he there's a bear. Or he goes home. He thinks that's a place of, of, of safety, of shelter. What happens? A snake bites him. Um, I read a story. Uh, it was an analogy where two hunters, they're in the woods, and they see a bear, and they drop their rifles. And one climbs a tree, and one goes in a cave. And they're, they, they're, they're saying, we're just going to sit here until that bear leaves. Well, that bear just sits down and gets comfortable. Guy comes out of the cave and he sees the bear and he runs back into the cave. He comes out a second time. He sees the bear and he goes back in the cave. The third time he comes out, the guy in the tree says, why do you keep doing that? Stay in the cave where it's safe. He says, I can't because there's a bear in the cave too. <laughs> that, is, that is what this is. Israel thought their relief was going to come in the day of the Lord, but nope, it's going to have the very opposite. Those who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will it be to you? What they thought was going to be safety is not going to be safety. So the Bible here says there's a similar kind of dilemma that will someday come upon the godless. They're going to find trouble in the very place they run for safety. Um, Amos, that's in Amos 5.18 According to the prophet Amos, these people may be religious. They may even long for the coming of the Lord without realizing that his arrival will present for them the greatest problem of all. And that's judgment for their wrongdoing. As believers, we don't fear this second advent. So who are the godless? I mean, these are the ones we know that don't turn. They never turn their sins um, to God's loving forgiveness through Jesus Christ. They love evil rather than good, um, even though they want the benefits, they don't necessarily qualify for them. Um, it's not a happy thought that one day this is going to be the coming day of judgment. So the person who never puts his faith in the Lamb of God, you'll find that in John 1, 29, one day will find that the Lamb will be unto him like a lion on one side and a bear on the other. Um, that's from Hosea 13, 7 and 8. We will be studying that. There's not going to be a place to hide, just like the dude in the cave. He'd come out and there's a bear here and there's a bear there. Someday, and then scripture talks about that. When a man flees from the lion, a bear is going to meet him. There is not going to be a place of safety. That's why it is so important for us as believers that we we declare the awesome, great and day of the Great day of the Lord. Awesome. <clears throat> Great and awesome, awesome day of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Because um, it's coming. Judgment is coming. Let's look now um, at um, verses 21 through 27. Okay. Oh, 
Go ahead. No, sorry. I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? You also carried along Sukkoth, your king, and Kayan, your images, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So what did he tell them he hated? Their festivals, their psalm assemblies, the way they were worshiping, false worship. Is that happening today? Yeah, and God still hates it. What does he require? <coughs> he requires justice, loving kindness, and what comes in with your Lord. Um, verses 25 and 26 he reminds the Israelites of the false gods that they brought with them, even from their time of Egypt. They were worshiping the sun, the moon, and the star gods. But he made those things. Um, but he's reminding them of their false worship. We may not be worshiping the star gods and the moon gods, but we, a lot of people worship the lake god, the football god, um, sports god. The what? Money. Money God. Yeah. Work. Work. We can even make family an idol. Um, anything that we put before the Lord. So it still is applicable to this day. And he says, I hate it. I hate it. I reject it. We, I don't even remember, we read these verses when we were was it studying Jude. Judah or Jude, and we talked about the psalm assembly and how important it was that we did it right that, so that um, it would be pleasing to him. Whew. That ends on a heavy note, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what do you take from this? What is your application? We need to know the word of the Lord and we need to obey it. Um, we need to, to learn what it means to have justice, loving kindness, and walk comfy with our Lord. And how to worship in spirit and in truth. I'm still learning that. I mean, this is a ongoing thing. Learning to worship. Obedience. Are we, are we promised that everything's going to be easy if we're obedient? Uh -uh. It's not. It's not going to be easy. But we need to, to speak up. Um, I believe for our nation, Christians for way too long have been silent. The, like that says in that verse back in 5, that the prudent have been silenced. Our, the opposition has been silenced. And even within our churches, we're too, confrontation, conflict is, is not comfortable. So we overlook a lot of things. And those who speak out, a lot of times it's not taken well. And there, there's consequences sometimes. But when we are following what the Lord requires, it is seek me that you may live. Don't seek man's approval. Don't seek man's rules. Seek me that you may live. Thank you for being here. One more lesson. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for being on the video. Um, hopefully it'll be up tomorrow. It should be if you're interested in watching it. Um, you are here. 
Somebody must be, like I said, there were 17 clicks on it anyway. Um, you might like to say anything before we close. You got four minutes. <laughs> I like when we end on time. It's a challenge. It's kind of like getting all your dishes you're preparing for dinner done at the same time. I love that challenge. I love that challenge to start at 7 and end at 8.30. <laughs> we did not end on time again this morning. Only four ladies were here, but we still were 10. <laughs> what made you realize when I studied this? Just because I studied what I was talking about. But there's a difference between social justice and God's justice. And we need to be able to know the difference. That's very important. And act on it. And act on it. So many times in our churches, what do what kind of justice do we practice? Social, Social justice. Yeah. We need to now I don't know, I don't know again like last week, I don't know how that looks necessarily. But I think if we seek him and ask him to reveal to us what that looks like. Uh, the answer might be a little difficult. Um, we may not like what we're told. <laughs> and unpleasant. Unpleasant. Okay. Susan, what was that you said? Critical race theory? Great. Look at that. Critical race theory. Yes. Sorry. It's been in the news recently. Yes. Donald Trump is against it. <laughs> Southern Baptists want to make it a resolution. Resolution number nine. Mm -hmm. Yes. We didn't meet this summer. I think they still have, because we didn't come together as a convention because of COVID, but I don't know what transpired amongst the board. I haven't had, I had other things going on this summer. <laughs> but again, thank you for being here. Um, thank you again, Sally, for opening up and letting us come in your beautiful church. Thank you, it's comfortable. I like it. All right, let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this word. Lord, help us to understand how to have justice like you require, to have loving kindness as you require, and to walk humbly with you. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to, um, to know your word, to understand your word. Lord, teach us. Let us not just have this knowledge for knowledge's sake, but so that we can tell others, that we can be obedient to it. Lord, help me to understand it. Lord, I thank you for the ladies that have come tonight. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the safety of this church that we meet here without fear. Thank you for everything you've revealed to us tonight. Thank you for the input from the ladies. Lord, thank you that we are learning and that so that we will not be led astray by false teachers and false knowledge. Lord, we ask that you be with us as the, in the coming week as we finish up the book of Amos. Teach us what it is you want us to know and bring us back again next week so that we can sharpen each other, that we can encourage each other and open your word and divide it rightly. And we just ask all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you.